October 31st, 1984, Indira Gandhi assassinated, shot by her own Sikh bodyguards. A shocked nation holds its collective breath. Savage anti-Sikh violence breaks out across Delhi. In just three days, almost 3,000 Sikhs are butchered. October 31st, 1984 is a date that few Indians can ever forget. Could Indira Gandhi ever die? Larger than life, populist, yet secretive, Indira Gandhi had imposed her presence on the nation over the last two decades. She was a war heroine after the 1971 war, a betrayer of democratic ideals after the 1975 imposition of emergency. She was a prime minister revered and feared in equal measure. 25 years after the assassination of India's first and only woman prime minister, we assess one of the most controversial political legacies in modern India, the legacy of Indira Gandhi. Welcome to our special show, Indira of India. Within hours of her death, Sikhs across the capital were targeted and slaughtered. In many instances, the killer mobs were led by local Congress leaders. A passive central government looked on. In some instances, even colluded with the attackers. The new Prime Minister, Indira's 40-year-old son, Rajiv Gandhi, seemed helpless, even unwilling, to stop the bloodshed. This was happening all over Delhi. And this was happening, uh, as I always like to say, within a one-mile radius of the Rashtrapati Bhavan. So it was shocking that such a thing could happen. The violence of October 1984 was typical of what the country had witnessed in the last years of Mrs. Gandhi's prime ministership. But the most serious crisis was in Punjab. In the attempt to divide the opposition Akali Dal, the Congress built up a fiery religious preacher, Jarnail Singh Bhindranwale, a fundamentalist whose agenda was a so-called spiritual purification of Sikhism. He started off by campaigning for the Congress, but ended up becoming an advocate for the separate Sikh state of Khalistan. In the name of Khalistan, Bhindranwale unleashed a campaign of random violence. Violence which by the summer of 1984 had spiraled out of control and claimed hundreds of lives. She allowed her reckless son Sanjay and very irresponsible but very experienced uh, Gani Zal Singh who was first her home minister and then president of the republic to build a Bindranwale in the hope that he will vanquish the Akalis. What they did not realize was that he, like everybody in this world, could also turn into uh, Frankenstein's monster, which he eventually did and devoured the Congress. The violence over Khalistan pushed Indira Gandhi to despair. She had written that year itself. If I die a violent death, the violence will be in the thought of my assassin, not in my dying. That year she acquiesced in a decision almost as if she knew it would cost her her life. Bhindranwale and his supporters had made the Golden Temple, holiest of Sikh shrines, their heavily armed fortress. On the night of June 5th, the Indian army attacked the Golden Temple. Operation Blue Star was launched. When the last gun fell silent, Bhindranwale lay dead, but so were over 300 commandos. 
More than 500 pilgrims were killed in the crossfire. 300 bullet holes riddled the Harmandar Sahib and the Akal Takht was badly damaged. The general who was an associate of um, uh, Bindranwale was a very clever military officer. And so when the army was sent in, they found that they came up against a full-scale, properly planned defensive operation. Blue Star was a monumental mistake, symbolic perhaps of the last years of Indira Gandhi's prime ministership, when she seemed to lose her famous self-belief in political shrewdness. That year her speeches had begun to sound almost prophetic about her own looming death. She had returned to power in 1980, but victory was followed by personal tragedy. On 23rd June 1980, her son and the one person whom she had grown to implicitly trust, Sanjay Gandhi, was killed in an air crash. By now, she trusted no one but her own family and turned to her other son, Rajiv, and daughter-in-law, Sonia, for comfort. She would stay on as Prime Minister, but the spark was gone. The fire was spent. She looked as if she had compromised too much and had now lost the heart to carry on fighting. By that time, Indira was a very insecure and somewhat paranoid person. And the only people she could trust were her own immediate family, which is why after Sanjay's death, she inducted Rajiv into politics. Ironically, it was Sanjay who was responsible for Indira's darkest moment and the darkest hour for Indian democracy, the declaration of internal emergency in June 1975. The High Court ruling had held her guilty of electoral malpractices and she was about to be unseated as Prime Minister. Sanjay, who was by now her chief confidant, would have none of it. Instead of respecting the Allahabad High Court judgment, Mrs. Gandhi turned her back on democracy, convinced that this was the only way to ensure her own political survival. Her political opponents were jailed. The media was muzzled. The daughter of India's original Democrat, Jawaharlal Nehru, became India's great dictator. For the first six months, she thought she had done the right thing to bring discipline to the country. But I, I remember she... She, she had uh, developed a great deal of depression on that and uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti was the one who used to give her solace and she used to break down crying before him. The emergency was the pinnacle of Indira's brand of ruthless politics. After all, it was she who was president of the AICC had persuaded her father Nehru to dismiss the communist government of VMS Nambudripad in 1956. If the father was the idealist, the daughter was the pragmatic practitioner of real politic. The daughter saw the seamy side of politics perhaps far too quickly in life. Uh, on power, she was very clear that she couldn't tolerate uh, any rival. She could not tolerate uh, any dissent which was, uh, uh, which was aimed at her. She took every criticism very personally. In early 1977, she suddenly decided to lift the emergency. Some say she did it because she was assailed by her own conscience. Others say it was because she was convinced she would win the next election. But in the spring of 1977, the unthinkable happened. Indira Gandhi was routed. The anti-emergency forces led by Jayaprakash Narayan under the banner of the Janta Party won. She didn't understand that India can best be governed if it is governed as a fully functioning democracy. And a fully functioning democracy requires democratic political parties and also institutions which have sufficient autonomy. Cast into the political wilderness with Sanjay by her side, she showed typical Indira Gandhi style political courage. As the Janta Party experiment crumbled, she strode into the crowds, taking her battle to the people, even riding an elephant across the swollen river to Belchi in Bihar, where a caste massacre had taken place. Indira Gandhi, to get to that village, had to take, I believe, a train, uh, a car, 
uh, and then an elephant because uh, you know it was monsoon and um, you know the roads had all slush on it. So it was kind of a spectacular display of political symbolism, and where the state government and the central government conspicuously failed to provide any help or succor to the victim, she was there. After the break, how Indira Priyadarshini went from Gungi Guria to Goddess Durga. Pakistan ko kiska khatra? Hamla hua to kis pe aaj tak hua? Koi Pakistan par hamla hua? Hamla hua hamare upar Hindustan. Years ago, on the 60th anniversary of Indian independence, a State of the Nation survey conducted for CNN and IBN by CSDS found that Indira Gandhi was the second most recognized Indian after Mahatma Gandhi. That even after two decades of her prime ministership, the Indira persona retains its mystique is indeed remarkable. Indira Priyadarshini, the shy, retiring daughter of Jawaharlal and Kamala Nehru, always her father's daughter the fierce protector of his legacy, yet a legacy she ended up almost destroying. She was a lonely child through the years of the freedom movement, surrounded by towering men of destiny. Her father had spent many years in jail through Indira's childhood, interacting with his daughter through letters. 1942 was the year of the Quit India movement. It was also the year of Indira's marriage to a Mumbai Parsi, Firoz Gandhi. For an aristocratic Nehru to marry an unknown Parsi, Indira's marriage seemed to be an act of rebellion. Mahatma Gandhi had to intervene and say, okay, well, this is the private matter. Nehru said, I don't want this, but if it's her decision, in this first clash of will over the father, she won. But in the 1950s, as Indira's marriage to Firoz began to fall apart, she slowly became her father's shadow. Slowly but surely, she was drawn to the Congress's power equations as information and broadcasting minister and as Congress president. But dynasty was not yet part of Nehru's succession plan. When Nehru died in 1964, it was Lal Bahadur Shastri who became Prime Minister. It never crossed Nehru's mind that Indra would succeed him as Prime Minister. Of course, he loved her dearly as his only child. Uh, he knew she would have a political role, but a minor political role. And it was purely by accident that she became Prime Minister. When Shastri suddenly died in January 1966, a fierce power struggle broke out to succeed him. In the presence of political heavyweights like Kamaraj, Muraji Desai and YB Chavan, it was Indira who was chosen as India's first woman Prime Minister, a consensus candidate who the party leadership was convinced they could easily manipulate. They thought that like the British Queen, she will only reign and they will rule. And they were a little taken aback when even as the Gungi Gurya, she refused to be a complete handmaid. But the dumb doll was far more hard-headed than her father. In 1969, she decided it was time to assert her prime ministerial authority. Egged on by her socialist friends, she nationalized banks and abolished privy purses. The old guard in the Congress, led by Finance Minister Muraji Desai, rebelled. The Congress was split down the middle, but a defiant Indira captured the support of a majority of the parliamentary party. From reluctant leader to street fighter politician, her transformation is complete. The way she handled, particularly by taking the younger people in the Congress with her, those who were socialist minded, or unke through mobilized kya sare apne members of parliament ko or Congress ke logo ko in the AICC. That is why ultimately the syndicate people got isolated. The 1971 general elections marked the coming of age of a new Indira. The self-effacing daughter of Nehru was now a self-confident leader in her own right, firing up audiences across the country with her Garibi Hatao slogan. The way the nationalized banks were nationalized, people in Delhi, rickshawalas, other poor, they danced in the streets. I was reporting at that time. So I asked them, I said, have you ever entered a bank? They said, no. I said, are you ever likely to go into a bank? They said, no. 
I said, then why are you jubilant? Their answer was that something is at last being done for the poor and the rich are being put in their place. That 1971 campaign saw the annihilation of her opponents within and outside the Congress. She was now the sole face of the Congress party. In December 1971, the third Indo-Pakistan war was ignited over the formation of an independent East Pakistan. With Generals Manik Shaw and J.S. Arora leading her army, Indira Gandhi invaded East Pakistan. The battle was decisive. Pakistani forces surrendered. Bangladesh declared independence. And Indian forces withdrew in record time before the United States had even had time to react. हमारे पड़ोस में अब नए नए हथियार आ रहे हैं हम हथियार से डरते नहीं है ना हम पाकिस्तान की पहली लड़ाइयों से डरे हम ये भी नहीं कहते हैं कि पाकिस्तान को अपने बचाव के लिए हथियार न मिले जरूर मिले लेकिन जो लोग देश दे रहे हैं उनको देखना है कि पाकिस्तान को किसका खतरा है हमला हुआ तो किस पे आज तक हुआ कोई पाकिस्तान पर हमला हुआ हमला हुआ हमारे ऊपर हिंदुस्तान के Richard Nixon called her a witch and a clever fox. But in India, Indira Gandhi was now Goddess Durga, conquering Empress of India. She was tremendously knowledgeable about the uses of power. And she was also always willing to use power internally or externally for India's purpose. On this respect, I would say, that she left Papa flat on the doormat. Between 1971 and 1975, she was at the very zenith of her power. For the next few years, Indira would march from triumph to triumph, each success adding to her personality cult. In 1974, the Buddha smiled. India went nuclear with Pokhran 1 in defiance of Western pressure. Indira was hailed even by her critics as a staunch nationalist. Just 12 months later, with the declaration of emergency, the same nationalist Indira Gandhi would be accused of pushing Indian democracy to the brink of disaster. Um, my friend Sri Chandraji Tiyadav said, the worst is over, but there are still difficulties. With all due respect, I would say, the worst is yet to come. We have no idea. Psychophancy had grown, but I told you why, mainly because of the young men. These people thought that, oh, the people have taken emergency well, and therefore we should continue with emergency. That was the argument given. Historians will probably see Indira Gandhi in two distinct phases. From 1967 to 1974, the emergence of a kind of mass leader that independent India had never seen before. A woman determined to build India as a self-reliant nation. But from 1975 to 1984, she was the ruthless power politician, betraying the ideals she was brought up with, betraying her father, and consumed perhaps with guilt and loss of self-belief, she hurtled further into destruction, destruction of herself, destruction of political values. Very wonderful person. I don't think one will come across for years, generations and generations, such a person. Indira Gandhi will be remembered as a great patriot and a deeply flawed democrat. A hero of the Bangladesh war. She'll always be remembered, in my view, as the second best prime minister we had, the first being her father. Indira Gandhi, a patriot who chose a tragically wrong way to execute her patriotism. In the end, she seemed to have almost willed her own death, as if to say she was no longer equal to the new India.